Hello and welcome to Dream City Omaha. My name is Robin and I want to thank you for joining us. If this is your first time, please let us know by texting WELCOME to 402-383-1874. Now sit tight as service is about to begin. This week is, is Palm Sunday. Next Sunday is Easter. And when you came in, you, you received some Easter handouts, some, some little Easter invite cards. We just encourage you to, to take that card, pray over it, pray and ask God, God, who do you want me to, to invite to be a part of our Easter Sunday celebration next week? Uh, if you want more cards, there are some more cards out there in the lobby. Feel free to, to take as many as you feel led and as many as you plan on using. I don't want you just to take them and, and make them all bookmarks in your books until next Easter, but take them, use them, give it to a, a server this week as you leave, the, leave them a very generous tip. Don't, don't tip them 5% and then invite them to Easter because they ain't coming. All right, leave, leave a good tip, invite somebody to Easter, but, but plan on joining us next week. We have three service times for you, 8.30, 10, and 11.30. We will be streaming the last two for those of, of you that are watching online. And for those of you online from Arizona and New Mexico, we welcome you. Thank you for being here with us today as well. Today is, is Palm Sunday. And, uh, and we're going we're gonna to start by, by looking at Palm Sunday. What does Palm Sunday reveal to us about Jesus. For those of you that don't know, Palm Sunday is the beginning of, of what is oftentimes referred to as Passion Week. And Passion Week is, is simply the last week of Jesus's life. It's, it's the week leading up to his death, his burial, and his resurrection, which is what we will be celebrating next Sunday. And so as we, we look at Passion Week, as we look into God's word at at Passion Week, this last week of Jesus's life, it's, it's interesting to me that as we read the Gospels, so much of the Gospels are dedicated to this week. So much of, of our four Gospels, the Gospels we find in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, so much of their writing and so much of their account is dedicated to Jesus's last week on earth. In fact, as we, we look at it, two-fifths of Matthew covers the Passion Week. The book of Mark has about three-fifths of it. Luke, about a third. And John, about half of John, is devoted to the last week of Jesus' life. As we look at all four Gospels, there are 89 chapters across the four Gospels. Of those 89 chapters, do you, do you, venture, a, would you, would you, would you venture a guess as to how many of those chapters are dedicated to the first 29 years of Jesus' life? Of the 89 chapters across the Gospels, only four of them cover the first 29 years of Jesus' life. 85 of them cover the last three and a half years. And of those 85, 29 cover the last week of Jesus' life. A third of the Gospels talk about Passion Week. And so we're going we're gonna to get into the scripture today. And as we, we read scripture, as we, we look at the story of, of Easter Sunday and, and Palm Sunday, which begins this period of time, we are given certain dates about things that happen. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of a, a history geek, if you will. And, and I have no problems calling myself that. I'm a, I'm a history geek and I'm a math geek. So I'm like double geek. Like I love history and I love math. And so when it comes to, to Passion Week, you're just gonna have to let me geek out for a second. And if you're a geek like me, then you can geek out with me and I'm gonna take you on this journey. And if that's not you, just bear with us for a few minutes, okay? Because as we look at Passion Week, we are given, we are given some certain dates. For example, Passover, which was celebrated every year by the Jews. Passover was always celebrated on the 14th day of the Jewish month of Nisan. Not the car, it was the, the month, Nisan. The 14th of Nisan was, was Passover every year. Now, as we read the Gospel of John, John tells us that six days before the Passover, they are at Lazarus's house enjoying a meal. So we can backtrack from, from Passover, the 14th of Nisan, which we know was Thursday. He celebrated that with his disciples the night that he was arrested the day before he was crucified. 
So if we go back six days from that, we can then gather and understand what day it was that Jesus was enjoying this meal. John tells us that it was six days prior. So for us, we would say, well, that's the eighth of Nisan. Actually, it was the ninth of Nisan. Because to us, when we count days, like from today to tomorrow, how many days is that? One day. To the ancient Jews, that was two days. Because they didn't have a zero placeholder. Today was day one. Tomorrow would be day two. Therefore, from today to tomorrow is two days. Are you following me? So when John writes that it's six days before Passover, really what that day is, is it's the ninth day of Nisan because he's counting today as day number one. Tomorrow is day number two and so on and so on and so on. So the day before Jesus comes riding into the city, we know is the ninth day of the month of Nisan. Therefore, when Jesus comes riding into the city on Palm Sunday, that's the 10th day of Nisan. Are you, are you with me so far? Any fellow geeks with me that are like taking notes vigorously? None of you. Okay, that's awesome. It's just, it's just me. So, so we understand Jesus came in on the 10th day of Nisan, or by our calendar, that would be April 6th of 32 AD. In case you were wondering, if you want to write that date down, you're free to. April 6th, 32 AD was the day that Jesus wrote in to the city as people are waving palm branches and crying out, Hosanna. Now, here's what's interesting, and, and I might lose some of you, but, but I'm just... just Bear with me for a second, because if we go back to Daniel, and there is so much that happens in Passion Week that on the surface we read it and it's like, oh, that's nice. Like, that's, that's a good story. That's cute. That's cool. I like how that this happened. But if we go back to the Old Testament prophets, and as we begin to, to understand Old Testament prophecy about the Messiah... And then we can start to put the pieces together that, wow, 500 years before Christ was even born, it was foretold that this exact same thing would happen. In Daniel chapter, chapter 9, there is, there is this prophecy. Go ahead and put that scripture up this morning. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, Daniel is there and the archangel Gabriel comes to him and, and tells him this is what's going to happen. And as part of this revelation to Daniel, here's what angel Gabriel says. He says, now listen and understand. Okay, I'm trying. He says, seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one in the ancient Hebrew language, that is Messiah, until the Messiah comes. So, so here Gabriel is literally telling Daniel the time that the Messiah is going to come. Now there's some things in this verse that we need to understand. First of all, what's a set of seven? Set of seven was simply a set of seven years. And so when he says seven sets of seven, that's seven sets of seven years. So what's seven times seven? 49. 49. You guys are fantastic. So he says 49 plus, what's 62 times seven? 434. There we go. So he says 49 years, uh, that, that's seven sets of seven, plus 434 years, which is 62 sets of seven, will pass from the time the command is given. So what's 49 plus 434? 483. Close. 483. So he's saying this, 483 years will pass from the time that the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah comes. Are you following me? Now, what would help us in this equation? You know how sometimes you have to solve for X or solve for Y? What is that variable? What would help us in this equation is to know when the command was given to rebuild Jerusalem. Well, fortunately for you, we just studied that. Because in Nehemiah, King Artaxerxes gives the command to Nehemiah to go back and to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. For those of you that don't remember, that's in Nehemiah chapter 2. And Nehemiah tells us that it was the beginning of the month of Nisan. Now we understand and we can, we can calculate, we know the year that that took place. And so if we go back to that date, Nisan 1 of that year, and we multiply out 483 years 
times 360 days. And I know you're asking why 360 days, John, there's 360, five days, four days, five or four, five days. Sometimes there's a leap year. That's where it gets confusing. So why are we multiplying by 360? Because their calendar was a lunar calendar. Our calendar is a solar calendar which is why we have to add in those random leap days for lost time and all this nonsense. Well, they they didn't have that problem because they went by the cycles of the moon. So there's 360 days in their calendar, 483 years from Nisan 1, when Artaxerxes gave gave that command to Nehemiah to go back and rebuild the city. If you do all of that math, do you know what date you come to? April 6th or the 10th of Nisan, 32 A.D., It's incredible. It's incredible when you look at the fact that this this prophecy, this this word to the prophet Daniel was given sometime around the mid 500s BC. And the the angel Gabriel comes to Daniel and says, Daniel, I'm going to tell you exactly what's going to happen. At some point in time, a command will be given to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And you can mark that date on your calendar. And if you take seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven, 483 years from that day, you will see the Messiah come. All of this time happens. And what happens on that day? Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. It's incredible when you begin to to look at that. Now, again, for those of you that are math geeks like me and history geeks, you're like, that's the coolest thing. For those of you that were just here to be entertained, you're like, I'm not getting it. (laughs) But we see what happens in the story. Mark chapter 11, we're going to read Mark's account of of Jesus' entry into the city. Mark chapter 11, if you have your Bibles, if not, the verse will be on the screens for you. But this is what the Bible says in verse number one. It says that as Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two of them on ahead. He said to them, he says, go into that village over there, and as soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anybody asks, what are you doing? Just say this, say, the Lord needs it and will return it soon. The two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied outside the front door. And as they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, what are you doing untying that colt? And they said what Jesus had told them, the Lord needs it and he will return it soon. (laughs) And they were permitted to take it. Now, imagine, if you will, that you're sitting on your front porch one day. Somebody comes up to your driveway, gets into your car, and starts to hotwire it. (laughs) Um, Excuse me, sir, what do you think you're doing? Oh, the Lord needs it, and we'll return it soon with a full tank of gas. Oh, by all means, carry on. (laughs) Essentially, is what is happening here. They they say they're permitted to take it. Verse 7, then they brought the colt to Jesus. They threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. And many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and people all around him were shouting, Hosanna. Hosanna. Praise God. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David, and praise God in the highest heaven. So Jesus came to Jerusalem. He went into the temple, and after looking around carefully at everything, he left because it was late in the afternoon. Then he returned to Bethany with the 12 disciples. Lord, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you. I thank you that, Jesus, you are who you said you were. That even as we go back into the Old Testament, that we see everything written in your word points to you. That there is not, there is not a, a chapter, there is not a verse that does not point to you as the Messiah, as our Savior, as the, the coming King. God, this morning, I, I pray that, that you would open our eyes, that you would open our minds, that you would open our hearts, that we would receive whatever it is that you're wanting to deposit in us today. 
God, I pray that you would speak to us so clearly, Lord, that, that you would reveal yourself to us through your word today, that you would encourage us, that you would, you would correct us, that you would, you would bring whatever it is that we need today in this moment. We love you. We look to you, the author, the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. Would you be with us today in Jesus' name? And everybody said amen. This morning, as we, as we read the accounts of that first Palm Sunday, the events that took place almost 2,000 years ago now, as we, as we look into the scripture and we, we see Jesus riding into Jerusalem that first Palm Sunday, they obviously didn't know it as Palm Sunday, but we do today. What, what are some things that we can take from this scripture? What are some things, I think there's, there's several things that are revealed to us about Jesus through this scripture. And, and if you're taking notes today, I, I would encourage you to write these down. If you're not taking notes today, I would encourage you to start taking notes today. But as we, as we look at the events of that first Palm Sunday, several things revealed to us about who Jesus is. And the first one is this, that, that Jesus is king. Jesus is revealed to us as king in the events that took place. Now, you might be, be sitting there saying, well, Pastor John, where do you see that? Because I didn't read that anywhere in that portion of text. Well, if we go back and we look at it, Jesus told them, he says, go to the village ahead of you. And just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden, untie it and bring it here. This tells us and it shows us Jesus's kingship. Still don't understand, Pastor John. I, I don't know where you're getting that from. Well, you have to understand how they operated in ancient times. Because in ancient times, it was forbidden for anybody else to ride the king's donkey. It was forbidden for anybody else to ride the king's colt. Be, because Jesus made sure to let them know, listen, there is, a, there is a donkey that is there. There is a colt that is there that nobody has ever ridden. Why? Because I'm a king and that's my ride and nobody else is allowed to ride it. Speaks to Jesus's kingship. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, we, we see this prophecy and he says, rejoice, O people of Zion, shout in triumph. O people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. So here Zechariah writes and he foretells of the coming king who's going to come riding into the city on a donkey. Jesus, as king, says, make sure you get me one that nobody has ever ridden. Why? Because I am the king. But why a donkey? Have you ever wondered that? Think of, of all things for Jesus to ride into Jerusalem on, why would he pick a donkey? Like if you're, if you're the creator of all things, you're the one walking on water. You're the one multiplying fishes and loaves and, and, and passing it out to it. Why a donkey? To me, it reminds me of that movie, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Have you ever, guys ever seen that movie? And, and the sheriff of Nottingham tells Robin Hood, he says, I'm gonna cut your heart out with a spoon. And his cousin's like, why a spoon, cousin? Why not a knife or an ax? And he says, because it's dull, you twit. It will hurt more. Do you remember that scene? Like, what? he said, why a spoon, cousin? And, and as I read this, I think, why a donkey, Jesus? Like, why not a lion? If you could have rode anything into the city, like, bring me a lion. Hey, go to that city over there, bring me a lion. That would be the equivalent of us today. Like, what are you going to drive into town on? There's a Geo Metro parked over there somewhere. <laughs> go, go grab it. The keys will be above the visor because nobody's protecting that thing. Nobody's even going to ask you where you're taking it, but bring it to me. Like, why a donkey? And again, if we, if we understand ancient civilization, as we understand ancient kingdoms, it begins to make a little bit more sense to us because as somebody was a king, they would, they would typically have two modes of transportation. One was a horse and the other was a donkey. Kings had horses, kings had donkeys. Okay, but what situation constitutes when I ride one versus the other? When the king was going into war, he rode a horse. When a king was going to offer terms of peace, 
he rode a donkey. And so Jesus, by choosing to ride a donkey into Jerusalem on that day, he was literally saying, listen, I as king of all kings am coming today offering terms of peace. Yes, one day Jesus in Revelation tells us that Jesus will come back riding a horse when the time for war and the time for judgment comes. But on that first Palm Sunday, Jesus came in as a king riding a donkey. Why? Because he was coming in peace. As we understand Palm Sunday, we see Jesus as king. The second thing that we, we see in the scriptures, we see Jesus as savior. Jesus was, was savior and it was, it was shown us in scripture as people responded to him. Those who went ahead, they shouted, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Now, Hosanna, yes, it's an exclamation of praise, but the literal translation of this word Hosanna is save us now. Literally what it means is, is I'm praying, pray, save us. Pray, save us right now. Pray, save us today. And so as Jesus is riding into the city, people are gathering, throwing their garments down and throwing, throwing palm branches down, throwing branches that they had cut in the field down. As Jesus is coming into the city and they're shouting and they're exclaiming, please save us. Please save us. Now, if we put ourselves in the place of a first century Jew, what, what, are, they, what are they asking for salvation from? If we understand where they're at, the Davidic line ended some five, 600 years earlier. They haven't had a king for the last 600 years. They've been in exile and it's just been a revolving door of one foreign power after another coming and imposing their will upon these people. Now they're, they're living under Roman rule and Roman oppression and really a cold and cruel society coming in and oppressing them. And so, so when they see Jesus come on the scene, hey, here's this man who, who, who speaks with wisdom we've never seen before, who speaks with authority that, that is beyond him, who does these miraculous signs and, and, and the word starts to get out, well, maybe this, is, maybe this is the Messiah. Maybe this is the one who it's been foretold is, is going to come and save us. And so, so here Jesus comes riding into the city and they're shouting, save us, save us, literally save us from the Romans. Save us from the Romans. And it's the same thing that his disciples asked even after Jesus resurrected, before he ascended into heaven. Jesus is, is now the time that you're going to restore the nation of Israel? Jesus is, is now the time that you're gonna set up your earthly kingdom? And Jesus is like, that's not why I came. That, that's, not what I'm, that's not what I'm about. I didn't come to establish any earthly kingdom. I came to establish my father's kingdom, a heavenly kingdom. It's not about nations of this earth. You want salvation from the Romans. I came to save you from yourselves. They were shouting, Jesus, save us from our circumstances. Save us from, from the external things. Save us from what's going on around us. And Jesus is like, but, but I came to save you from what's going on inside of you. I came to save you not from somebody else, but I came to save you from yourself. You don't even recognize what you need salvation from. Jesus came writing in as a savior. The third thing that we see Jesus as, is Jesus as our sacrifice. Jesus came in, I told you before in the, in the beginning that it was, it was April 6th of 32 AD. It was the 10th day of Nisan. Now, if we understand the 10th day of Nisan, if we understand Passover, if, if we were, were practicing Jews, all of these dates would mean significantly more to us than they do for us as, as non-practicing Jews, and, and we hear Nisan and we think Altimas. But to, to a Jew, the 10th day of Nisan, which is the day that Jesus came riding into Jerusalem, was much more significant than just a regular Sunday. Because it goes back all the way to the book of Exodus when they're in, in Egypt, enslaved under the Egyptians for, for 400 years. They've been enslaved there. Moses, 
tries to deliver them on his own, can't do it. He's in the desert. We know the story. God comes to him in the burning bush. Says, Moses, go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. Moses goes to Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh says, no, fine, plagues. And through a series of plagues, God begins to get Pharaoh's attention. Finally, Pharaoh says, he says, no, I'm, I'm not letting you go. And God says, all right, this is your last chance. He says, if you don't let them go, then the firstborn of, of everything is going to die. I'm going to, I'm going to kill the firstborn of everything. And yet God comes to the Israelites and he, he tells them, here's what I want you to do. And as we look at Exodus chapter 11, here's what God says. He says, tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, which is the month of Nisan, on the 10th day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. Verse five, the animal you select must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat, but make sure that it has no defects. So again, let me just, let me just set the scene for you. They're, they're in Egypt. They're, they're living as slaves in Egypt. God is, has told Pharaoh and the Egyptians, the firstborn of, of everything is going to die. God tells Moses, the, the only way that I will pass over your house, which is where they got the term Passover from, the only way that I'll pass over your house is if on the 10th day of Nisan, every family selects a lamb or a goat, perfect lamb, spotless lamb, no defects. You sacrifice that lamb. You take the blood of that lamb and you put it on your doorpost. And, and when the angel comes and sees the blood of the sacrificed lamb on your home, he will pass over your home and no harm will come to you. You will be saved in this moment, not by anything that you've done, but because of the sacrifice offered by this lamb. Are you following me? And what day did this all take place? The 10th day of Nisan. What day did Jesus come riding into Jerusalem? The 10th day of Nisan. What's interesting is as Jesus is riding in and people are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest heavens, laying down their garments and their palm branches. Some of them had either just come from the market where they bought the lamb for their family sacrifice or they were on their way to the market to buy the lamb for their family sacrifice. But everybody in the city at this time is thinking, I need a lamb to sacrifice. Today is the 10th day of Nisan. And on the 14th of Nisan, we will celebrate Passover. But today is the day prescribed in the law of Moses for me as, as the head of my household to find a lamb without blemish, without defect, without spot, without, without anything wrong with it. And, and I need to procure this lamb to offer so that my family can be saved in remembrance of what God did for us while we were in Egypt. And this is the backdrop that God chooses to send his son riding into Jerusalem. You're all looking for a lamb to be slain and Jesus comes riding in saying, here I am. You're looking for a perfect sacrifice to be offered for you. Jesus says, I'm here. You're looking, you're looking for the blood of a lamb that you can paint your homes with. My by my blood, your sins will be forgiven. By my blood, you'll be washed and made new. You're looking for a physical lamb. I am the, the ultimate lamb. We see it referred to throughout the New Testament. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and, and he says, Christ, who is our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Paul refers to him as such, let's continue. Go ahead and put that next verse up there. John chapter one, John the Baptist is, is there baptizing people. Well, how did he refer to Jesus? He, he saw Jesus coming and he says, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. First Peter chapter one, Peter himself writes and says that it was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. Everything that that Jesus did, he, he came and he fulfilled. Yes, he was king. Yes, he was savior, but he was also our sacrifice. Jesus writing in, it was, it was no coincidence 
that it happened to be the 10th of Nisan. It was no coincidence that it happened to be the day where the, the sacrificial lamb was being selected. It, was, it wasn't by coincidence, it wasn't by happenstance, but it was all by God's design and God's plan. Today, we commemorate the start of, of Passion Week. And, and even as they celebrated Jesus that day, so do we today. They were, they were looking for one to, to save them. Jesus came riding in. They were looking for kingship. Jesus came riding in. They were looking for sacrifice. And Jesus came riding in. And it might not have been what they thought, and it might not have been how they looked, but he came as the ultimate fulfillment of all three. Today, I would, I would ask, who's king of your life? Who is, who is the, the king of your life? Who sits on the throne of your heart? For many of us, it's us. It's us, it's, it's me, it's, it's my wants, it's my desires, it's this is how I feel, this is what I think, this is what I'm going to do. Maybe it's, maybe it's our kids, maybe it's a job, maybe it's, it's something else. Today, Jesus comes as king. They weren't looking for it, but that's what he was. They were looking for an earthly king. Somebody had come and reestablished the, the Davidic line. Jesus says, yes, I am from the line of David, but my kingdom is not of this earth. They were looking for a savior, somebody to save them from Roman oppression. And Jesus came and said, I am that savior. Even though you want salvation from your circumstances, I came to, to save you from what's really plaguing you. And that's the sin inside of you. It's the death and the brokenness and the corruption of this world. They were looking for sacrifice and Jesus came and says, you don't need sacrifice anymore because I came to establish the new covenant. Now it's not about how many lambs have been slain. It's about whether or not you place your faith in me as the perfect lamb. Do you call upon me? Do you look to me not just as your savior, but as your Lord and as your king as well? It's interesting. There's one last portion of scripture that I'll, I'll leave you with today, but in Ezekiel chapter 11, the prophet Ezekiel is, is given a picture of God's glory leaving the temple. And, and the Davidic line has, has ended. And, and Ezekiel's given this, this picture in Ezekiel chapter 10 and chapter 11 where, where God's glory is there and angels come into the temple and God's glory rises up off of the temple and literally leaves the city. It leaves the temple, God's glory, which has resided in the temple, leaves the temple, it leaves the city. And Ezekiel tells us, I saw it and it rose up and it left out the east gate and it left east of the city and it left up and it resided on the mountain that is east of the city. And God's glory remained there. So God's glory is no longer in his city. It's no longer in his temple, but, but God's glory has left. God has left the building, essentially, is what Ezekiel said. What's interesting is when you look at Jerusalem and you understand the, the geography, what mountain is east of the city? The Mount of Olives. So when Ezekiel saw God's glory leave the city, he said, I saw God rise up in his, his presence, his glory left through the eastern gate and, and up and left out east and resided on the mountain east of the city, the Mount of Olives. The Bible tells us that before Jesus came riding in, where was he? He was in Bethany, which is a city on the Mount of Olives. And when the disciples brought to him that colt, he came riding in from the Mount of Olives, east of the city, in through the Eastern Gate. And where does it tell us that he went? Into the temple. So as Ezekiel saw God's glory leave east of the city on the 10th day of Nisan, Jesus riding on a donkey, as the king, as the savior, and as the ultimate sacrifice comes literally bringing God's glory back the same way that it left. When you see Jesus in all scripture, when you start to, to read the word of God, not for information and not for knowledge, but for, for transformation, Jesus, show me you in this scripture. You'll find him. You'll find him. Ezekiel, hundreds of years earlier, says, I saw God's glory leave centuries later. Jesus, as Messiah, comes riding that same road 
walking through that same gate into that same temple, bringing God's glory back. Why? Because that's what Jesus does. Jesus brings restoration to broken things. Jesus restores those things that have been broken. Now, I don't know where you're at today, and I don't know what may be broken in your heart or broken in your life, but Jesus is here to restore those things. I don't know if you need to, to experience Jesus as king, as savior, as sacrifice, whatever it is that you need to experience him as, he is here today to show himself as such. If you would, just stand with me this morning. We're gonna pray and, and we're gonna close, but I'm gonna give you an opportunity to respond to the word of the Lord, whether you're here, you're watching online. Lord, I thank you that as, as we look at scripture, <laughs> written over a period of thousands of years, multiple different authors, and yet, God, thematically, and even beyond thematically, but, but everything in your word points to you. There's no contradiction. There's, there's no conflicting reports. But everything points to, to a God who loves us, who had a plan for us, and as a result of our actions, yes, sin and brokenness and with it death entered the world and yet your plan included sending your son to restore those broken things. Jesus, we, we celebrate you as the Messiah, as the King who has come and the King who one day will come again. We thank you that we can receive you as our savior. Lord, even today we cry out, Hosanna, save us. God, I need salvation. I need saving from myself, from my sin, from my mistakes. Lord, we thank you that you are our sacrifice. That we don't have to to go to the market to buy a lamb or a goat, that we don't have to, to paint any, any blood on our, on our doorposts at home because Jesus, it wasn't by, by any lamb's blood, but it was by your blood. It was because you were willing to shed your blood as the ultimate sacrifice for all of us. We thank you for the new covenant, which is found in you. Lord, today, for those of us who, who need to put you on the throne of our hearts and declare you as king, God, we do that. For those of us who, who need a, a savior to, to save us, or would you do that? For those of us who need to accept you and receive you as the sacrifice and as the payment for our sin, would we do that today? If that's you and you're here or you're watching online and you've never, you never received Christ as your savior, as your sacrifice, the Bible tells us that anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It says that it's by grace that we've been saved through faith. It's not by anything that we've done, but it's a free gift that God has, has made available to us. And the way to accept that gift, to receive that gift is to confess our sin to place our faith in him. And so today I wanna to lead you in a, in a prayer to do just that. Church, would you help us to pray today? If, if you're out there and you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and as your sacrifice, just pray this prayer with us. Just say, Jesus, thank you so much that you gave up your life so that I could find new life in you today. And I declare I'm a sinner desperately in need of a Savior. There are things that I've done and things that I've said that I'm not proud of, that I wish I could do over. But your word says that if I confess those things, that you would be faithful to forgive me. Would you forgive me of my sin today? Would you help me to live for you, not just today, but every day for the rest of my life? 
Make me brand new. Give me a new mind and a new heart to follow you in all of your ways. In Jesus' name. Let me pray for you today. God, I thank you for those that prayed that prayer. Lord, this morning as we, as we celebrate the beginning of Passion Week, as we remember and reflect on the day that Jesus, you came riding into Jerusalem to cheers from the crowd, cheers of Hosanna, praise God, save us. Jesus, you revealed yourself as the coming King. You revealed yourself as Savior and you revealed yourself as the ultimate sacrifice. And God, this week, I pray that you would just help us to reflect, help us to remember that this wouldn't just be another week, but, but God, as we read your word, if one third of the gospels are devoted to the last week of your life, then may we take this week and just reflect on your goodness, on your faithfulness, on your mercy, on your grace. Lord, if there's anything in us that we need to surrender to you, what better time than, than right now? Lord, for those that prayed that prayer, I pray that you would go with them, that you would Continue to reveal yourself to them. Draw them close to you. And God, as we draw near to you, we thank you that you draw near to us. The rest of us this week, God, I pray that you would help us to be salt, to be light, to be that city that is, is set on a hill. Lord, that we would go this week, give us opportunities to have real conversation with people, to invite them back on Easter Sunday as we gather to celebrate your resurrection. And because you have new life, we have new life as well. We love you. We thank you. Go with us, be with us, help us to reflect your goodness in every interaction that we have in Jesus name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. If you're here today and you prayed that prayer for the first time, some of our prayer team is down here. We would love to, to minister to you, pray for you, let you know what, what's next. Uh, if there's any, any need that you have, you want somebody to agree with you, we'd love to be able to do that for you. Those of you online, thank you for being with us. If not, be dismissed. Have a great week. Love you, church. Here at Dream City Omaha, we're all about three things. Helping people discover Christ, recover identity, or uncover purpose. If you enjoyed today's service, we encourage you to check out our past sermon series as well as our discipleship classes Give us a subscribe and we hope that we can help you grow no matter where you are.